Good morning, everyone. My name is Marie Kasprick, and I'm the director of Georgetown Law's Institute of International Economic Law, or short, IIEL. On behalf of IIEL, welcome to everyone in the room and online. A special welcome to our distinguished guest, the European Commission's Executive Vice President and Trade Commissioner, Valdis Dombrovskis. At this pivotal time in history, we'll talk about war and values today and the importance of the transatlantic alliance in time of crisis. With that, let me briefly introduce our speakers before we head straight into the, the program. Please note that there will be time for questions in the end. Our host and moderator, Jennifer Hillman, is professor of practice at Georgetown Law, teaching the lead courses on international trade. She is also the co-director of Georgetown Law's Center on Inclusive Trade and Development, a senior fellow with the Center on Foreign Relations, and co-chair of the Center for Climate and Trade. Across her roles, she's writing extensively on the intersection of climate change and trade and prospects for border carbon measures. Previously, Jennifer was commissioner at the U.S. International Trade Commission, as well as general counsel at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Since completing her term as a member of the World Trade Organization's appellate body, she contributes to the debate over how to best transform the WTO into an institution that is fit to take on the 21st century issues on inclusive trade and sustainable development. Now to our distinguished guest, European Commission Executive Vice President and Trade Commissioner, Valdis Dombrovskis. Prior to his current role, Valdis Dombrovskis served as European Commissioner for Financial Stability, Financial Services, and the Capital Markets Union. And from 2014 to 2016, he served as Vice President for the Euro and Social Dialogue. He built his deep experience in finance and ex economics as former Finance Minister of Latvia and Chief Economist at the Bank of Latvia. Growing up in Latvia, he is someone who grew up with Belarus and Russia as his largest neighboring countries. In this light, EVP Dombrovskis has experienced firsthand what it means to live under Soviet domination and also what it means to become independent from Russian influence. Supporting Latvia's path towards freedom, democracy, and prosperity after Soviet occupation, Vice President Dombrovskis served three consecutive terms as Prime Minister of Latvia from 2009 to 2014, becoming the longest serving elected head of government in the nation's history. We are honored to have him here today to talk about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what it means for Europe, but also for the United States, the West, and our transatlantic alliance. Executive Vice President Dombrovskis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to address this uh, distinguished house of uh, learning. Uh, Georgetown schoolers feature prominently in the highest levels of policy making and diplomacy on both sides of the Atlantic. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Hillman, for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, um, in the late 1990s, I was a a student at the University of Maryland, less than 10 miles away from uh, here, and I still feel uh, home uh, here. It's always a pleasure to return to Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, of course, my transatlantic convictions were formed long before my studies in the U.S. Uh, well, as it was uh, mentioned, I grew up in Latvia, one of many European countries that fell under the Soviet control after the World War II. Uh, my generation looked to the West. This is where we saw the hope for a better future. Uh, as a teenager, I remember spending uh, hours in trying to find uh, radio stations like uh, Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, which were blocked by the Soviets. Uh, these stations gave us a snapshot into a different world, a world we wished our country to be a part of. And it was uh, during my uh, teenage years, during, uh, during the late 1980s, uh, that the uh, popular movement for Latvian independence grew uh, stronger and stronger. There's a process which we're calling singing revolution. Uh, Latvia declared its uh, restoration of independence in May 1990, and uh, as the Soviet Union fell apart, become a de facto independent. 
so my country and many others uh, could now pursue a new path, a path towards freedom and prosperity, uh, a path towards a democratic future as members of European Union, NATO, and the wider West. The US was our protector, ally, and friend in this journey. We uh, never forget that US condemned the Soviet occupation of the three Baltic states and refused to recognize their annexation. Uh, uh, so as a members of European Union and with the US support, we have come a long uh, way. But this year, the world changed. Uh, the global, uh, global order we were, so uh, we were so proud to join is under attack. Uh, Russia's illegal and barbaric invasion of Ukraine puts all our old certainties into question. Uh, because, uh, let's make no, no mistake, this is not just a local dispute. Uh, this is a cruel war of aggression whose consequences are being felt not just in Ukraine and Europe, but right around the world, including here in the United States. Uh, because by invading, by invading Ukraine, together with its accomplices in Belarus, any last shred of doubt is uh, uh, disappeared. Uh, Vladimir Putin has declared an open war uh, on the West. So today I uh, wish to make an urgent appeal to leaders on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, we must do more to help Ukraine to defend itself and to win this war. The uh, innocent people in, uh, of, of Kiev and Kharkiv and Mariupol need our support. Uh, we have seen full horrors of Russian recent atrocities, and the West must not turn another way. And uh, uh, if Putin is not stopped in Ukraine, he will go further. Uh, if we do not show strength now, there is every possibility that he will invade other neighboring countries or even challenge NATO in Baltic states or Poland. Uh, there are wider reasons uh, why our engagement must intensify. Uh, because uh, Ukraine is literally depending on the free world. Uh, uh, Putin's threat is not just to Ukraine, but to democracies uh, everywhere. We have entered an era where autocracies stand against those who believe in democracy, rule of law, and global institutions. Uh, we cannot afford to waste any more time in acting against this uh, threat. In parallel, we must look into wider geopolitics. Uh, once again, it falls on the transatlantic alliance to provide urgent global leadership. Today, I want to present three suggestions uh, for this uh, uh, crucial mission. Uh, first, our immediate response to the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Second, strengthening transatlantic relations. And third, updating the international architecture. Uh, let me start with Ukraine. Uh, uh, many in the Western Europe and in the U US believed uh, uh, that a war of invasion could no longer happen in Europe. Yet, uh, here we are. And I can assure you that the eight uh, EU countries uh, subjected to the Russian control in living memory, this came as no surprise. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the only surprise is that other countries were surprised. Uh, a, decade, uh, a decade ago, uh, during my years as uh, Prime Minister of Latvia, we could already uh, detect patterns emerging there were signs of Russian interference in Baltic political processes. Uh, over the years, these practices spread uh, uh, through increased disinformation and Russian support for uh, populist movements and politicians across Europe and indeed here in the United States. Uh, Russia's meddling in referenda and elections on both sides of the Atlantic has been proved beyond doubt. Uh, now Russia has moved from hybrid to real warfare. Uh, in this terrible context, uh, we can now say with confidence that countries of the Central and Eastern Europe were correct to rapidly seek EU and NATO membership. Uh, because these alliances provided us with the protection and support to gain the political and economical independence from Russia. Now it's our duty to help the besieged people of Ukraine. So how should we respond? Uh, already significant steps have been taken. 
uh, uh, US intelligence has been vital for supporting Ukraine's uh, heroic resistance. Uh, and EU-US coordination and response has been swift and strong, surprising the Russians. Uh, uh, the EU, uh, the US and EU countries have supplied uh, weapons to Ukraine. And for the first time in EU history, we have funded the purchase of such uh, weapons, uh, aiming to supply uh, Ukraine to the value of one and a half billion euros. Uh, but this is not enough. Ukraine desperately needs more. Uh, uh, we have moved fast on sanctions. Um, they are biting hard. Uh, the Russian economy is taking major blows. Uh, the EU has so far uh, deployed five packages of sanctions, which uh, target uh, individuals, trade, and uh, financial and business entities. Uh, we have frozen hundreds of billions of dollars in Russian central bank assets. Um, uh, actually, the war has triggered many welcome changes on how the West deals with oligarch wealth. We are cleaning our banks of dirty money, notably by freezing oligarch money and assets, and we should make these changes uh, per moment. And we must ensure that sanctions are properly and quickly enforced and not circumvented. Uh, we are also working with our global partners on freezing and seizing Russian assets. Uh, in parallel, we have seen many companies acting on their own will and leaving the Russian market. They have not compromised values for profit. And I encourage those companies that have not yet left Russia to do the right thing. Uh, I recognize the important contribution of U.S. companies uh, such as um, Starlink, which provided satellite facilities for Ukraine, uh, Google Max, uh, which hel helped to track military movements, helping many civilians to survive, uh, Uber, which have offered free trips for refugees to the Polish border. Uh, we will continue to ramp up uh, pressure as long as Russia continues its uh, aggression. Uh, every possible step must be taken so that Putin can no longer finance his war. And uh, when the war is over, we must make sure that the aggressor pays for the damage inflicted on Ukraine. <clears throat> now, let me turn to Ukraine itself, the country I know well. Um, human losses are mounting by the day. Uh, more than 10 million people have been uh, displaced and millions have fled the country in search of safety with 4.7 million entering the European Union. The economic damage to Ukraine is devastating. Uh, its economy will shrink by around 45% this year. Its industrial and agricultural base is being bombed. It's an economy at war. Uh, the EU has worked in close partnership with Ukraine since uh, the 2014 Maidan revolution. Ukraine belongs to the European family. Uh, already, we have invested uh, 20 billion euros in uh, Ukraine in the last seven years. Uh, this uh, investment was condition, uh, conditional for undertaking different uh, difficult reforms. Uh, it was not easy, but many positive changes have been into implemented, notably in the areas of public administration, taxation, banking, uh, justice, and uh, customs. These reforms brought Ukraine closer to the EU, and made it stronger, more democratic, and more resilient. Uh, they played no small part in the country's capacity to resist Russia's uh, aggression. Uh, helping to rebuild Ukraine after the war will be a Herculean task. Uh, we have already started the developing an EU solidarity fund for this. And actually, at yesterday's IMF and World Bank uh, meetings, we agreed to coordinate closely our support to Ukraine's refinancing and uh, reconstruction needs. Uh, in the immediate term, we need to find better and faster ways to support Ukraine and freeze out Russia. Uh, Russia's global standing has taken a battering. Uh, the country, uh, uh, country's place in global institutions uh, is hanging by the thread. Uh, every day, it uh, uh, moves closer to being an international pariah. Uh, yeah, but we see hesitancy from some parts uh, of the globe on turning against uh, Putin's Russia. 
Uh, part of this is down to uh, Kremlin's propaganda in spreading their narrative about what is uh, happening in uh, Ukraine to other parts of the world. So we must work to stop this uh, propaganda uh, machine. Uh, in parallel, we must continue to strengthen transatlantic uh, relations. Uh, ha happily, uh, things were already moving in the right direction in the post-Trump uh, era. Uh, we uh, were successful in removing a number of trade irritants. We agreed on a new global corporate tax architecture, and we created new uh, forward-looking ways to cooperate, most notably by setting the new Trade and Technology Council, and our next meeting will be in three weeks in uh, Paris. This was a real statement of a shared intent to lead the race to forge the rules and standards of the future economy. Uh, now the renewed momentum of transatlantic cooperation has to speed up even more, because if we fail to provide global leadership at this uh, pivotal moment, we can clearly see what the alternative is, and it is not a pretty sight. Uh, together, the EU and US form the world's largest trade and investment partner partnership based on shared uh, values and rules. Uh, in the coming months, uh, we will have to cooperate very closely in areas such as uh, energy prices, food security and farming, supply chain uh, uh, disruptions, and of course, inflation. Uh, in the euro area, inflation rose to the all-time high of 7.4% in March, uh, uh, and overall, we expect, uh, as a result of current geopolitical shifts, the EU economy to slow, but not to stall. Uh, but it's clear that the burden on our people and businesses will grow. grow. Uh, clearly, there is economic cost of cutting our ties with Russia. But I believe it's a price worth paying in, uh, in a defense of democracy and to preserve European and global security. Uh, we will have to press fast forward on our plans to diversify our energy supply, um, making Europe uh, independent of Russian fossil fuels. And the US will help with increasing its LNG supplies. Uh, also, finding new suppliers for raw materials such as uh, palladium, uh, palladium, titanium, and uh, nickel. Uh, <clears throat> there, new and existing trade deals <coughs> such as with uh, Canada and Australia will help us uh, to achieve this. And we have to persuade uh, other countries to, uh, join, uh, 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 to join us, not just like minded countries, but a broad set of uh, countries around the world, including China. Uh, we also must learn the lessons from this crisis. Um, uh, this means calling out populists and Putin's apologists on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, those who were happy to take Russian money, those who presented a positive spin on Putin's regime, uh, those who refused to speak out when Russia annexed uh, Crimea, those who benefited from election interference and cyber attacks. Uh, we must keep reminding our citizens of these uh, facts uh, because we now have clear evidence uh, what can happen when such populism is left unchecked. Uh, I therefore applaud President Biden's uh, strong commitment to collective global action to boost democracy. Let me now turn to the global institutional picture. Uh, the swift reaction of Russia's aggression highlights uh, two things. Uh, on the one hand, it proves the necessity and enduring wars of values-based global bodies. They provide the essential stability necessary for the economic recovery. They uphold the rules of the game at the time of gross violations. On the other hand, we have seen how much these bodies need a reboot. Uh, our sanctions and other actions were conducted in full compliance with a global legal base, uh, so the machinery still works, but clearly we need to make it work uh, better. Uh, institutions like the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, all acknowledged that they don't have the means to act under the current rules. Uh, they have no mechanisms for removing a member even one who behaves as appallingly, uh, appallingly as uh, Russia. So uh, already before there was ample evidence that institutional reform was uh, needed, 
um, institutions must uh, also be agile enough to uh, respond to the broader geopolitical shifts, notably the rise of uh, China. And there must be consequences for those who refuse to play by commonly agreed rules. Uh, to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to deliver a very uh, simple message. Uh, we must stay the course in supporting Ukraine and putting pressure on Russia. This is imperative for political and business leaders, as well as for citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, there can be no compromise with uh, tyrants and war criminals. Doing so will be no uh, easy and uh, will have to pay a price. There is a risk that the war fatigue may kick in, and this is uh, understandable. Uh, but this is nothing less than an ex existential duty for all of us to defend our freedom, our privileges, and future prospects. Ukraine is fighting for the fundamentals uh, of what the West has stood since the World War II. Russia is on the wrong side of history. Ukraine is on the right side. And there is hope. With uh, our support, Ukraine can win this war. Uh, Putin's big mistake was to think that uh, uh, there will be no consequences for his invasion. Uh, in fact, the Western world is more united now than it has been for many generations. We have shown extraordinary unity of purpose and uh, principle. We have shown that our values still matter. Now we must show how far we are willing to go to defend them. Thank you. I want to start, maybe if I could, with one of what I think is the big takeaways from your remarks, which is that we may be headed back in the direction of, of a kind of a Cold War with countries like Russia uh, frozen out of, of the global economic system. I mean, for me, if I, if I look back over the last 20 years, it seems that the United States and Europe and, and some of our allies pursued the idea that by tying ourselves economically uh, to some of our adversaries, including Russia, including China, uh, that we could prevent great power conflicts, that we could turn those countries toward openness, towards free markets, even nudging them uh, towards democracy. Uh, and yet we've seen Putin invade Ukraine despite all of the pledges by the Western world not to do that in, in violation of that absolute most fundamental principle of international law that you cannot change borders through the use of force. We've seen China under Xi Jinping crush democracy and free press in Hong Kong, uh, take more military actions with respect to Taiwan, uh, you know, again, enter into its no limits partnership with Russia. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, that you and those in the eight European Union countries that had lived under Soviet rule were not surprised. I guess my question to you is why were all the rest of surprised? Why did we not hear uh, this message of what was going on? What went wrong? What did the institutions that were designed to stop this fail? And where, what should we make of these lessons that you've so, so clearly laid out? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, of course, a very good uh, question. What uh, went uh, wrong uh, and why we uh, ended, uh, where we ended up? Uh, I think there may be a bit of a combination of uh, uh, wishful uh, thinking and uh, just plain uh, business interests. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, clear that uh, after the uh, collapse of the Soviet uh, Union, there was a thinking that uh, uh, countries will be transitioning towards uh, democracy, including uh, Russia. There was willingness to engage with Russia, and that was all. Uh, understandable and to the extent even uh, working in 1990s. Uh, but uh, things uh, gradually uh, have started to change with uh, Putin's uh, ascent to the uh, power, uh, because uh, it must be said that uh, immediately uh, one could see that you have a different uh, kind of uh, leader at the head of uh, uh, Russia. Uh, because one of the first things uh, Putin was doing, he was uh, cracking down on uh, media uh, freedom. That was really the first thing he was uh, doing. And uh, in a sense, uh, this uh, direction towards authoritarianism was uh, uh, very uh, uh, clear. 
Uh, and uh, gradually uh, also uh, he and Russia became more uh, kind of confrontational it's in its rhetoric uh, towards uh, the West uh, with the rhetoric of uh, 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 the collapse of the Soviet Union being the largest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th uh, century and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, okay, there were many uh, people who were kind of willing to cooperate, willing maybe to ignore, ignore some negative uh, signals. Clearly, there were uh, uh, business uh, interests. Russia was a significant uh, uh, market for a number of companies, including European uh, companies. Russia was uh, a significant supplier of uh, hydrocarbons, uh, uh, energy resources. So uh, clearly, uh, there was also economic case to engage with uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, those uh, warning signals uh, basically went uh, un unnoticed and they were accumulating. Uh, and uh, in the problem uh, that uh, the absence of proper Western reaction was just facilitating further steps. So uh, when uh, uh, Russia invaded Georgia in 2008, taking away parts of its territory, hardly anything was done. Some very timid sanctions, but uh, uh, what close to nothing. Uh, when uh, uh, Russia invaded Crimea in 2014 and uh, invaded uh, part of the Donbas, uh, also, okay, some sanctions were introduced, uh, also some uh, export controls were introduced. Now we are learning a lot how they were actually circumvented and Western uh, companies supplying uh, prohibited goods and arms and uh, other things to, uh, uh, to Russia. So. Uh, something was done, but uh, clearly not enough to uh, build up this uh, uh, pressure. Uh, I remember uh, after the time, after uh, Russia's invasion in uh, uh, Crimea, uh, uh, Russians were kind of laughing about Western uh, sanctions, uh, saying, okay, so what do we have uh, after the first set of sanctions? So on the positive, we have Crimea. Uh, on the negative, a dozen of people will not be able to go for the West for a couple of Okay, on a balance, it makes sense to continue. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, it, in a sense, uh, encouraged this uh, Putin's and Russia's aggressive uh, behavior when they saw that their kind of uh, uh, aggressive behavior invading uh, neighboring countries, also meddling in political processes in uh, neighboring countries, in EU countries, even in the United States that it all uh, is not really uh, uh, meeting the firm uh, response. So they uh, allowed also themselves to uh, move into this uh, uh, narrative. Okay, uh, West is weak, West is decaying, uh, West is a fading uh, power. So uh, uh, we can do uh, uh, whatever, uh, whatever it wants. Uh, okay, now uh, uh, one can uh, uh, look back and think what can could have and should have been uh, doing uh, differently. Uh, but uh, it, what is important right now is what we are doing now, how we are responding now. And there it must be said that uh, uh, now the West response is clear and strong. And it's important that it stays this way and it stays this way as long as uh, needed. If I can follow up a little bit on that. I mean, I, I do think it is very clear to everyone that this is very different. Uh, the sanctions were both w far more comprehensive, far deeper, far faster um, in, in their application. But on the flip side, if you look at who is engaging in the sanctions, what you do not see is any countries in Central or Latin America imposing sanctions, any countries in Africa, any countries in the Middle East, any countries in South Asia, any countries in Southeast Asia. Should we be concerned that this looks like a very uh, Euro-US West sort of development without the rest of the world joining in this effort? And we're going to end up with a very sort of bipolar world in terms of those that are that are in the block that impose sanctions and those that are not? Uh, well, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, it's uh, a valid uh, observation. Of course, there are also uh, countries from other uh, 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 regions who are engaging, who are imposing uh, sanctions, including uh, Japan, including South Korea, including Australia, uh, just to mention uh, uh, some countries. Uh, but it's uh, clear that there are so many countries who are not uh, engaging in this uh, uh, effort and probably the country which makes the uh, most difference in this regard is uh, China. So uh, we uh, recently had a EU-China uh, summit where we were discussing uh, uh, a lot about these uh, topics. 
And it's uh, clear that China is kind of uh, uh, maneuvering. Indeed, uh, you mentioned this uh, 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 Xi Jinping's re rhetoric that friendship between uh, China and Russia knows no borders or no limits. Uh, uh, but in reality, we see that there are quite, 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 uh, uh, quite, quite a limits. So on one hand, one can say, okay, China is not really um, engaging with the West, uh, uh, but it's also not really engaging with uh, uh, Russia. It seems to be hedging its uh, uh, bets and probably seeking. Uh, maximum benefit from uh, itself uh, in this uh, situation. So that's why I was mentioning also in my uh, speech that it's important that we are not only working with like-minded partners, because <coughs> like-minded partners are already on board. We're already applying sanctions, we're already putting pressure, we're already supporting Ukraine, uh, but we need to work with a, a wider global uh, community indeed uh, uh, to uh, 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 avoid the situation where, uh, with few exceptions, indeed, it's kind of a Western world which is responding. So I, I wonder if I could then turn. I mean, obviously, the clear thrust of, of your remarks is to stress the importance of shoring up the transatlantic alliance. Um, and there, the area where we've seen, I would argue, the most progress um, and where there appears to be so much promise ahead is the Trade and Technology Council, with all of its working groups you know, covering such a wide array of issues. I'm just curious from your sense, where do you think this effort is headed and when? I mean, are we likely to see formal agreements coming out of it on issues like mutual recognition of standards or adoption of common standards, coordinated approaches to export controls? What role have you seen the TTC playing in coordinating sanctions on Russia? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, let's uh, uh, be uh, clear. TTC is in a sense, forward-looking uh, uh, coordination uh, framework, which allows us to work on a number of uh, policy areas uh, across different sectors of technologies, like semiconductors, like artificial intelligence, uh, like many uh, uh, sectors of uh, trade, like supply chains resilience, like uh, export controls, investments, screening global trade challenges. So it's uh, a forward-looking uh, cooperation framework. So this is not a primary uh, framework uh, where we are dealing with Russian sanctions are dedicated uh, 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 in a sense uh, work streams which are dealing and coordinating specifically uh, Russia's sanctions but um, it must be said that also Trade and Technology Council help in uh, this regard uh, because uh, as I was mentioning one of the work streams uh, is export controls uh, and the very fact that our uh, experts were already working together, uh, starting to coordinate our export control approach, uh, addressing some of the differences and difficulties we had with each other uh, approaches, uh, it helped to build uh, trust and it helped uh, in this way to uh, be able to act in a fast and uh, determined uh, way. And by now one can say that we managed to uh, uh, jointly uh, to uh, limit Russia's access at least to half of the technologies which they are uh, needing. And it's already now, it's not such a long time, uh, it starts being felt across different sectors of Russian uh, industry, including uh, military uh, industry. So the fact that we were working on these uh, uh, issues in a cooperative way helped us to move fast on uh, uh, sanctions. So in terms of uh, concrete results, well, actually, uh, yesterday I had meetings both with um, uh, Secretary Raimondo and Ambassador Tai to discuss, amongst other things, uh, our preparations for Trade and Technology uh, Council. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed, uh, we will definitely will be working how we can better uh, uh, strengthen our uh, coordination on export controls. Uh, Another uh, topic I also briefly mentioned is the question of mitigating supply chain disruptions, which are coming from the world, diversifying our uh, supplies. Uh, there, I think it's important that we're also, uh, in a sense, uh, cooperating and uh, comparing our approaches, how to best uh, diversify away from, uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, on mutual recognition, indeed, is one of the areas where we are hoping to have some uh, first uh, concrete uh, results. So uh, uh, the work is uh, ongoing, and we look for a good outcome in uh, the uh, TDC, uh, which is in mid-May in uh, Paris. Fantastic. 
Um, one of the other areas of, of US-EU cooperation, and one I guess that I find particularly intriguing, is the idea of putting together a green steel and green aluminum uh, deal between the United States and the EU. As I understand it, the idea being that the US and the European Union would restrict access to their markets uh, for non-participants in this arrangement that either do not meet the standards of low carbon intensity or do not meet conditions of market orientation and contribute to non-market excess capacity. I mean, I, I, I just would love to hear your thoughts on what the EU hopes to achieve with this agreement. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, for this uh, agreement, uh, one needs to uh, know a little bit uh, pre uh, prehistory, how this agreement came uh, being. Uh, uh, because, uh, uh, in a sense, um, um, uh, we uh, had major uh, issues when um, uh, Trump administration imposed uh, uh, tariffs, um, so-called Section 232 tariffs, on uh, EU steel and uh, aluminum. So uh, uh, we had been dealing with this topic with the Trump administration, not uh, very uh, successfully. We were imposing some, in a sense, contra-tariffs against the uh, United uh, States as a response to their tariffs. Uh, but uh, clearly, it was a major trade uh, irritant. So when a Biden administration came uh, into office, uh, we uh, were reaching out to each other to, to, to resolve this problem. Uh, and uh, uh, why there is a problem, uh, especially in steel sector? Because there is a global overcapacity. And there is a, uh, also a global uh, forum to address this uh, uh, overcapacity, but frankly, it's not delivering very efficient results. So uh, clearly we need to see how we uh, address this question of global overcapacity. Uh, so instead of fighting each other, how we are uh, systemically uh, 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 addressing this issue. Uh, and that's uh, how, in a sense, we uh, reached interim solution on this two, uh, two uh, steel and aluminum uh, tariffs. Uh, so on uh, one hand, uh, we uh, agreed to the solution where U.S. is replacing uh, their tariffs with tariff rate quotas, at least respecting the historical trade uh, volumes, which are entering U.S. Um, tariff uh, free. Uh, but uh, from the EU, it's very uh, clear that we see end destination of this work, uh, complete normalization of trade, complete lifting of those 232 uh, also tariff rate. So, you so those are two parallel uh, processes. Uh, so uh, and uh, basically the idea was in order to finalize this work, we need to address this global issue, and that's where the global steel and aluminium arrangement comes in, dealing, as you rightly noted, on uh, greening the industry and addressing uh, global uh, overcapacity and non-market uh, practices. Uh, and we have quite ambitious uh, timeline. Uh, normally, uh, it should enter into force by uh, October next year. So we'll be uh, working very intensively now in the coming months to uh, make it a reality. And obviously, for, for many, the intriguing part of it, in, in part, was not necessarily just the trade side of it, the, the need to resolve the 232 tariffs. But this idea of how are you going to measure low carbon intensity? What are you going to do to any steel or aluminum that might be exported into either of those markets that does not meet that criteria? Um, could you tell a little bit more? How, how do you see that moving forward? Yeah, well, uh, uh, these are exactly uh, the issues we are uh, currently looking how to best address. Well, in the EU, we have already certain tools at our uh, disposal, for example, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, we know that's not necessarily a uh, uh, direction where U.S. is uh, looking, but uh, then we need to see how we uh, align our approaches in a sense without creating new uh, difficulties between us. Uh, so, uh, uh, but to just to elaborate a bit on this carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, idea is uh, the uh, following. That uh, currently, we are uh, allocating free CO2 emissions to energy intensive uh, industries, basically to avoid carbon leakage. Uh, because uh, if you start putting price on uh, carbon, then uh, industry may just relocate and we will end up 
uh, importing still polluting um, steel or cement or whatever. Uh, 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 so not reducing global emissions, but just uh, uh, destroying our uh, industry. So, uh, but since we now how European Green Deal, we have uh, decided to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and to reach um, uh, 55 percent emission reductions already by 2030. So it's clear that we cannot continue with free emissions um, for uh, uh, energy intensive industry. So we need to put price on carbon uh, and that's what we'll be doing. But then we need to address carbon leakage by other means. So what we are saying is that we are putting price on carbon uh, and any importers which are importing also must pay the same price of uh, carbon. Uh, uh, which means that um, uh, if uh, the third country is also having its emission trading scheme or something similar, uh, pricing the carbon, it will be factored in. So in ideal scenario, when uh, another country has exactly the same system and carbon price as the EU, no CBAM is to be paid. Uh, if uh, uh, there is a, a difference, this difference needs to be paid. So basically to ensure the level playing field between European industry and uh, uh, importers. And we were very careful to make sure that it's WTO compatible. Uh, and the key word there is non-discrimination. So we are uh, treating our domestic producers and uh, importers the same way. Both will uh, uh, effectively will have to pay the same price and do you see this green steel and aluminum deal as being exactly the same as the CBAM, or would it require something different uh, with respect to steel and aluminum? Well, I, I would say it's unlikely going to be the say exactly the CBAM because uh, uh, from our context with the U.S. administration, it's uh, clear that U.S. administration is not looking so much in the direction of uh, pricing carbon, but rather on set of uh, regulatory uh, measures and maybe some incentives how to reduce uh, uh, the emissions. So that will be one of the tasks of this global steel management to see how we uh, reconcile those uh, uh, different uh, approaches. All right, I'm gonna ask maybe one last question before we open it up to the audience. So I would urge all of you out there uh, to, to think about uh, the questions that you would wanna pose. Um, the last one I want to turn to is, is the WTO. Um, obviously, the WTO is scheduled to hold its long postponed ministerial meeting during uh, the week of June 13th. Um, I think many view this as a very crucial meeting for the organization, given the various malaises at the WTO, whether it's you know, the demise of the appellate body, the failure to reach really any significant new agreements other than the trade facilitation agreement, um, the, the, the real pressing need to come to an agreement on, on how do we limit subsidies for fisheries before we all overfish um, all of the fish out of the ocean. You know, the concerns about whether the, the sort of core raison d'etre of the WTO remains where it should be. I mean, a heavy focus on, on non-discrimination when, when many see that the WTO really needs to start addressing uh, how, to, how to fight climate change, how to join the fight against COVID how to think seriously about development, how do we work on issues of inequality, uh, a lot of things that are now being laid at the feet of the WTO. And at the same time, a lot of concern that, the, you know, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made any meetings um, in which Russia is perceived to be there in the negotiations almost impossible for a number of members of the WTO. And yet others take the view that you know, it's, it's an institution that's bedrock principles non-discrimination, if, if Russia is a member, Russia has a right to be at the table. And you have these very competing views over how to approach it. And, and as you noted, the WTO has no procedure or rules to simply kick Russia out of the WTO. That does not exist um, in, the, in the current rule book. How do you see this ministerial going forward um, at all in some ways? And if you then step back from it, what would success look like for this particular ministerial? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, indeed, you uh, described uh, all the uh, complexity which we are uh, facing ahead of the WTO uh, ministerial. So I'll outline uh, a bit uh, what, what we would see as a uh, successful uh, outcome or, well, 
realistically successful outcome. Uh, so uh, it's uh, clear that WTO needs to be able to uh, uh, respond to the um, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics. So uh, the question on the uh, agreement on trade and health, uh, carrying uh, 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 different uh, aspects, uh, including the uh, question of how to improve the global access to uh, COVID vaccines, uh, uh, diagnostics and uh, therapeutics, uh, uh, how to avoid uh, uh, export uh, restrictions and uh, export bans, especially in uh, cases of uh, uh, pandemics, how to ensure the uh, transparency, uh, also how to properly address uh, intellectual property uh, issues. Uh, uh, you know, we have been working very intensively in quadrilateral format, European Union with the United States, with uh, with India, with uh, South Africa on uh, this particular topic. So the first block is um, uh, trade and health. Uh, then I would say now there is a new uh, urgency which needs to be addressed, which is uh, uh, food accessibility as a consequence of uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war, because uh, Russia is the world's biggest exporter of wheat. Uh, uh, Ukraine is the fifth biggest exporter of wheat. There are many countries which are dependent on Ukrainian supplies, and uh, currently Russia is deliberately uh, destroying uh, uh, the grain storages in Ukraine. It's blocking uh, Ukrainian ports, so they cannot really export their uh, uh, wheat. So, uh, uh, and we're already seeing uh, food prices going up, uh, volatility in uh, uh, food uh, commodities markets. So uh, something also I think World Trade Organization needs to uh, address uh, also among uh, other things, avoiding uh, uh, undue export restrictions, which normally only tend to worsen the situation and especially worsen the situation for uh, uh, least developed countries. So, uh, uh, so we need a coordinated uh, response uh, to uh, the global food security challenges uh, caused by the war. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, agreement on fisheries subsidies. That's a bit strange um, uh, process because uh, several times uh, uh, there was a feeling, okay, we are just at the brink of agreeing and, and somehow it's always evading. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll be able to finally nail it down in MC12. Uh, okay, uh, it's uh, still issues which are unresolved, but that could be a positive outcome. Uh, so, uh, and uh, def definitely uh, you uh, mentioned the institutional reform itself, uh, the, uh, and we think that WTO needs reform across all its core uh, functions, uh, uh, negotiation, monitoring and deliberation, uh, dispute settlement. Uh, we have already more than a year ago come with a detailed WTO reform proposal from the uh, European Union. So what we would see as a realistic outcome is to set up a WTO working group, which would start working on all those aspects with the aim of reaching uh, outcomes by MC13. So what do you need from the United States in order to get to that successful vision of a ministerial? Uh, well, uh, it's uh, clearly well, uh, uh, none of this will happen without uh, engagement of the United States. So what we need is... Uh, uh, in, in engagement and uh, uh, constructive cooperative uh, approach. And it must be said that if we compare with the Trump administration uh, years, uh, clearly we see uh, much more willingness and uh, uh, openness uh, to, to engage, to work in institu international institutions, including WTO. Well, we know that there are some uh, kind of uh, difficulties in the US, which are like bipartisan difficulties concerning the functioning of the appellate body. Uh, actually, the blockage of the nominations for the appellate body did not start with Trump administration, it started with Obama administration. So, uh, uh, so there are some uh, issues where which we clearly need to uh, uh, discuss and see how uh, U.S. concerns can be uh, addressed, but basically we just need engagement and uh, uh, const constructive uh, uh, spirit and willingness to reach agreements. Fantastic. All right, I'd now like to open it up uh, to our audience for, for questions. Ah, over here. And please briefly introduce yourself. If you could please introduce yourself and, and then uh, present a question. 
Sure. Um, I'm Allison Redding. I'm a 2L JD student here at Georgetown. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my question is, what other goals do you have for the transatlantic relationship in the next two years, apart from the crisis management aspect? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, a part of um, uh, uh, crisis management aspects, well, uh, uh, we were talking already uh, a lot about uh, trade and uh, technology uh, council because that's really not about crisis management. That's a forward-looking uh, format, uh, how we can be in the lead of setting uh, rules and standards for new and emerging uh, technologies and how we can uh, cooperate uh, together based on our shared uh, democratic uh, approaches and uh, values. Uh, so uh, that is uh, definitely uh, one area uh, that we need to cooperate in a good, uh, positive, forward-looking way. Uh, uh, clearly, uh, we need to maintain and develop our trade and investment relationship. Our trade and investment uh, relationship is the largest in the world. Our uh, trade turnover is over a trillion euros every, uh, uh, every year. Uh, so uh, it's a major engine for economic growth and uh, prosperity. We need to uh, uh, clearly uh, cooperate on uh, this. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, cooperate providing leadership to global challenges, uh, including uh, uh, climate change. So uh, now leaving apart uh, the geopolitical problems which we are facing. Okay, over here. Peter Rashers from the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Mr. Executive Vice President, what lesson, if any, do you think that the um, United States and European Union should draw from Russia's invasion of Ukraine for um, their approach to China's role in the global economy? And in that respect, do you think it's the similarities between China and Russia that are most important or the differences in how the US and the EU should um, look at China? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, it must be said that we are having a very uh, a complicated and complex uh, relations with China and goes for the EU and goes for, for the US. So how we have uh, formulated uh, it in the EU that we see China as cooperation partner in some areas as uh, economic competitor in others and as a strategic rival yet in uh, others. Uh, for example, when we discuss climate change, clearly we need to cooperate with uh, China. China is the world's biggest emitter, so if we will not have China on board, we will not uh, achieve a meaningful uh, outcome. Uh, when we uh, discuss uh, uh, many uh, China's economic uh, practices concerning the role of state-owned enterprises and their competitive uh, neutrality, uh, concerning uh, the forced technology transfers, concerning intellectual property rights, uh, concerning the uh, industrial subsidies and transparency of industrial subsidies, uh, there uh, uh, it's uh, clear that we need to uh, work to uh, re-establish a level playing uh, field through multilateral tools like WTO, uh, but also through bilateral cooperation between EU-US, also bilateral cooperation, EU-US, Japan. Uh, so, uh, and uh, China is also strategic rival, which is promoting a different socioeconomic model. So, um, and I would say we, broadly speaking, maybe U.S. is describing it in a different terms, but we, broadly speaking, share the concerns, we share the uh, diagnosis. Uh, so uh, it's uh, clear that we need to uh, seek answers to these um, uh, com uh, uh, complex uh, relations, uh, and uh, especially uh, in uh, current very complicated geopolitical situation, I think it's important that we are seeking ways how to uh, uh, in, engage with China, how to ensure that they are not really forming some kind of uh, Russia-China alliance, because currently it's not the case, and we see that uh, China is, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, maneuvering and uh, uh, trying to find its own uh, uh, way in this uh, 
situation, so we should be working to nudge them to the extent possible on our side. We have one question uh, also from our virtual audience, which very much goes in line with um, Peter's question. So I might read that out as a follow-up question. We have it from Wendy Cutler from the Asia Institute, who is asking how, how if at all, does um, the invasion of Ukraine impact um, uh, the uh, European Union's relationship to China or um, positioning towards China? Does that make it more urgent, more likely to work together with China, less likely? Does it impact it at all? Uh, well, uh, I was uh, mentioning that we had already, uh, after the Russia's uh, invasion, we had uh, EU-China summit, where we were uh, trying to uh, uh, discuss all those uh, issues. Well, as you know, it, it, it was a difficult uh, summit. Maybe there were questions which were left unresolved or unanswered, so clearly further work will be needed. Uh, uh, we agreed to uh, uh, work towards the establishing our uh, high-level um, uh, trade and economic uh, dialogues to, um, to have some uh, uh, engagement there, because we are seeing that also there are certain problems piling up on the, uh, on the uh, 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 trade side. So I would say it has not uh, fundamentally uh, changed our approach to uh, China, uh, but it uh, uh, clearly emphasizes the need to seek ways how we can uh, cooperate uh, China and, uh, and, as I said, how we can nudge them uh, uh, more on our side. Well, on that note, I think we have reached the end, uh, end of our hour. I think this is a conversation that could have gone on and on. Uh, as I know, I would have had many more questions, but we really thank you, uh, really, for the, for the very eloquence of, of the European Union, of the statement of hope for transatlantic alliances getting ever stronger and deeper. I think that is clearly the message that I would take away from this. And, and I would simply like to thank First, um, Marie Kasparek and those here at the Institute of International Economic Law for their work to put together this event. Uh, to all of, uh, all of your colleagues at, at the European Commission offices here in Washington for, for their thanks, uh, our thanks for all the help in coordinating this. And most of all, thank you. Uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful discussion and, and we very much appreciate it. So, so thank you. Thank you.